Yes, I'll just uh, dive right into it. Um, today, the case I'll be speaking on is the Anchor and Chubb case, a uh, decision of the Supreme Court in England, handed down um, just last month, actually. I think it was 9th October. Okay. So, uh, what I'll be covering quite, uh, I think, quite quickly before we go into the commercial discussion um, will, will be the, these issues on the screen here. Uh, the different laws that apply to a contract, uh, the issue in this case, right, that was to be determined, the facts of the case, and then uh, I'll, I'll be going through the, the discussion uh, of, of the uh, actual decision of the Supreme Court. Okay, so just as a starting point, right, um, this case concerns uh, basically how you decide what the applicable law of an arbitration agreement is. Okay, so before we get to that, I thought I should just explain very briefly uh, what sort of laws tend uh, apply in contracts. Okay, so you've got, generally speaking, when you've got a contract with an arbitration agreement in it, and I think in the shipping context, all of us are familiar, you've got charter parties, bills of ladings, uh, construction contracts, and so forth. Um, they, they usually tend to have arbitration agreements in them. So in those sorts of contracts, um, there are three sorts of laws to, to bear in mind that, that uh, you know, play a role in, 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 this, in this contract. The first is the substantive law right, of the contract. So that's the law usually you know, in your CPs, for instance, you'll say the law, governing law of this contract is English law. So it means all the clauses under that contract uh, to be governed by, by English law. The curial law or the law of the seat, right? That's the second law that can apply in the contract. Uh, that determines the procedural law for any arbitration. So for instance, if you have again a, a, a charter party where you go, uh, you know, English law uh, arbitration in Singapore. So Singapore's the law of the seat. So Singapore law applies the procedures around the arbitration. Now, the third type of law that applies in a contract, which is uh, the subject of this uh, case, is the law of the arbitration agreement. Okay, so in, I, I guess in quite a lot of contracts, you don't actually have an express choice of what law applies to the arbitration agreement specifically, right? You'll have the governing law of the contract, you might have the seat of the contract of the arbitration, but then you won't necessarily have uh, express clause saying what the law of the arbitration agreement is. So in this case, Anka and Chubb, that was the main issue that was uh, for, to be determined in uh, the case. All right, so this is the issue, right, as, as, the, court, as the Supreme Court spelled out, uh, that they had to determine. And the issue is which system of law governs the validity and scope of the arbitration agreement when the law applicable to the contract containing it differs from the law of the seat. Okay, so, so that, that's the issue. So the significance of uh, the law of the arbitration agreement, as, as is spelled out in, this issue, uh, in the issue here, is that um, it determines whether your arbitration clause or arbitration agreement is valid, and it also determines uh, whether the dispute falls within the scope of that arbitration agreement. Okay, with that out of the way, I'm just moving on to the facts of this case. So this case is, was, was not a shipping case. It was actually a, a case, uh, it it's, it's involves insurance and construction actually. So it all began with a fire that broke out at a power station in 2016, right? So there was a fire, uh, Chubb, the insurer, Chubb, the insurer was the uh, insurer of the owners of the power plant, right? So. Because the fire occurred, Chubb covered the owner's loss. Uh, they paid out a claim, uh, about $400 million to the insured, and then they became subrogated to the insured's rights. So just to explain, you know, if you're not familiar with insurance, a subrogated right is when you know, the insurer pays your claim, and then they kind of step into the insured's shoes, and then they sue whoever was responsible for the loss uh, to recover the money. Okay, so then... Unipro is the insured owner of the power plant, so they were, they were the insured. Then Enegoprect was the main contractor, and Enka, who was a party to this, uh, to this case, is the subcontractor. So to, to cut it a bit short, uh, basically this case involved Chubb Russia having paid uh, the, the uh, 
the owners of the power plant for the damage, Sharp Russia was trying to bring a recovery claim against Anchor, the subcontractor, who Sharp believed was responsible for causing the loss or causing the damage. Okay, so the important bit is really here, the arbitration agreement. Um, so the contract that Chubb was suing Anchor on contained an arbitration agreement provided for ICC rules. Um, it said that the place of arbitration was London and it also contained an escalation clause. So again, to explain, an escalation clause is one of those dispute clauses which some of you may have seen. Uh, where there's a step-by-step -step process before you eventually get to an arbitration. So the first bit, we say, you know, if the dispute arises, parties will meet within 14 days and negotiate. And then, you know, if the it cannot be resolved by res settlement discussions, it escalates to maybe the managing directors of which company have to meet, and then so forth, and then finally get to arbitration. Um, the important point to bear in mind, not about the arbitration agreement, but about the main contract was that this uh, contract on which um, Chubb was suing Anchor did not contain any express choice of law, right? So it didn't say what the governing law of the contract was supposed to be. That was just completely silent. Okay, so procedurally what happened was um, after Chubb paid out the insurance insurance claim and then Chubb was going after, started to, you know, wanted to bring a claim against uh, Anchor, right, for, 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 for the damage and for the recovery. So Chubb actually started the proceedings first in the Russian courts. So Chubb sued Anchor in the Russian courts. Anchor then applied in the Russian courts for the claim to be dismissed on the basis that the claim should be dealt with in arbitration in England. Right, so the Russian courts actually dealt with uh, were the first uh, courts that were invoked in this case, um, and the Russian courts in made an interesting decision. They actually dismissed Chubb's substantive claim against Anchor, and then at the same time, they also dismissed Anchor's application uh, for dismissal of Chubb's claim. So basically, the Russian court said, "Chubb, your substantive claim against Anchor fails." Right, so Chubb, Anchor doesn't have to pay you, but at the same time. We are also saying that uh, the Russian courts has jurisdiction and it shouldn't go to arbitration in, uh, Lond in London. So, so that, that was the decision of the Russian courts. And then both parties filed appeals because they, they both lost. So where this case actually came to the English courts uh, uh, was in September last year, right? Because after the Russian proceedings that had been started, um, Anchor, Right, filed for an anti-suit injunction in the London courts. So I get to explain that term. Um, an anti-suit injunction is, a, is, a, is an order that you get from a court, right, which prevents uh, your, your counterpart from suing you in another country. Right? So in this case, Anchor said, you know, we've got an arbitration agreement in Singapore, uh, sorry, in, in, in London. Um, and then Anchor went to the English courts and asked for an order to stop Chubb from suing Enka in Russia and instead to compel them to sue in, uh, in, in arbitration in, in, in London. So that set things in motion in the English courts. So at the high court level, uh, Enka applied for the anti-suit injunction and then the high court actually uh, refused to grant the, the ASI. Enka then appealed it went to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal allowed Anchor's appeal and then issued the ASI. And then after that, Chubb appealed. And then we got that. That brings us to the Supreme Court decision. Okay, and then in the meantime, just for, for background and all, Anchor actually started uh, the dispute process in London that, that eventually led to arbitration uh, commencing. Okay. Now, moving to the judgment, um, it was a split decision by the Supreme Court. So we had five judges, right? So it's a 3-2 decision. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting that even though now we have a Supreme Court decision on the issue, there were quite, uh, there, there were differing views on how the result should have turned out. But uh, the, the way it works is we follow the majority court decision, okay? The, the minority court decision is, is not the position of, of, uh, of what English law is now. Okay, so just running through what the court decided 
on the issue that, that, that I put up in my earlier slide. Okay, in, in, how, in determining how, what law applies to an arbitration agreement. Okay, first, the court said that the arbitration agreement is to be determined by English common law, right? So basically, the court is saying that if the claim comes to, if uh, the English courts have to decide what law applies to the arbitration agreement, uh, the English courts will apply uh, English law. That's quite un uncontroversial. Then the court also said that um, it, under English law, the rules that apply, that, that, that uh, the rules provide that the applicable law, right, is either one, the law chosen by parties to govern the agreement, right, so express agreement. So, for example, if it says English law is to govern the, is, is the applicable law of the arbitration agreement, then that, that's the law that applies. Second, um, it's the law chosen, uh, is, is the impl law, implied law that's chosen by parties. So by that, I mean to say that the courts can look at the contract and the circumstances and say that even though, you know, parties didn't expressly spell out what this contract is supposed, uh, what the applicable law is, looking at the contract and the circumstances, the court infers that parties intended for, say, English law to apply. Then the third stage is if there is the courts cannot determine what choice of law there was by parties, either express or implied, then the courts look at what system of law has the closest connection with the agreement, with the arbitration agreement, and then that's the that's the applicable law of the arbitration agreement. So those are just general principles, also still un, uncontroversial. The guidance that this um, that the Supreme Court gave is, is, in, is in the next point they made, which was that where the law of the arbitration agreement is not specified, a choice of governing law of the contract will generally apply to the arbitration agreement. Right. So by this, the court means that um, if your contract doesn't say uh, English law is to be the governing law of the arbitration agreement, right? so it, it's silent on that point, then the court will look at what is the governing law of the contract that's been chosen. So if the contract contains a general clause saying that this contract is subject to English law, right? then in that case, there's a presumption that the English law also applies to the arbitration agreement within that contract. Okay, so the reason for that or the, or the reasoning behind that, that the court came uh, used was, was it, it, it makes sense. It's just that your arbitration agreement is one of the clauses in the contract, right? So if the governing law of the contract says English law, then that English law impliedly applies to the arbitration agreement within that contract. Okay, next the court also said that the choice of a different seat of arbitration uh, does not negate the inference that the choice of law of the governing con of the contract uh, was intended to apply to the arbitration agreement. Okay, so here they're talking about an example where, for instance, you've got uh, Russian law as a governing law of the agreement, and your seat is English law. Yeah, sorry, your seat is uh, is London. So if your arbitrary, if your if your contract says Russian governing law, and then seat in London, um, the inference is still that Russian law uh, is the gov is the governing law of the arbitration agreement, right? So that that's that's that 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 much is clear so far. The next stage is the court said also that in certain instances um, the choice of seat of the arbitration may apply to the arbitration agreement. Okay, so, but, but these are certain exceptional circumstances. So for example, um, if you've got the seat of your law, say if you chose Scottish law, right, as the seat, or you chose Scotland as the seat of your arbitration, um, Scottish law will apply to the arbitration agreement because there are specific laws in Scotland 
that specifically say so. So that's one of the examples that's given. Um, another example where they say, you know, the seat of the arbitration might be relevant um, is if, for example, applying the law of the contract will result in the arbitration agreement being ineffective. Okay, so if, if you apply the law of the contract to the arbitration clause, arbitration agreement, and that effectively means that the arbitration agreement is invalid, then, you know, the, 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 it, it, the, the inference may be drawn that actually this law, the seat of arbitration was meant to apply to the arbitration agreement. Okay, the next point is that in the absence of any choice of law, right, so there's no express or implied law choice of law in the, uh, uh, to govern the arbitration agreement, the arbitration agreement is governed by the law which it, with which it's most closely connected, right? So where parties have chosen a seat of the arbitration, this will be the law of the seat, even if it differs from the laws governing the substantive contract. So putting it all together, it basically means that the presumption as a starting point is that the governing law of the contract will, in most instances, right, uh, be the law of the arbitration agreement Right? Because that's a choice of law made by, uh, it's an express choice of law of the, or, an, it's an, or an implied choice of law of the, of, the, of the contract that applies to the arbitration agreement. Right? In certain circumstances where there's no express or implied choice of law made by parties to the main contract, then you look at the seat of the arbitration and then uh, the seat of the arbitration, the law of the seat of the arbitration would apply. Right. So I'll just add also in, in passing that uh, in coming, making its uh, arriving at its decision, the Supreme Court also actually uh, referred to uh, Singapore cases. And I'll just say that the Singapore cases are quite uh, consistent with, with what uh, the Supreme Court actually decided. So applying all of that to the effects of the case, um, the Supreme Court uh, decided that uh, there was no express or implied choice of law, right, made by the parties in the contract, right? So the contract was silent on what law was to apply and the court couldn't imply from parties, um, you know, from, from the terms of the contract or from the circumstances, what law was to apply. And then, so, you know, so they had to go to the third test, right? Which is at the, which is the first point I've made on, on this slide. So at the third stage of the test, they said the applicable law to determine what the applicable law is, then you look at uh, you know, the law of the seat of the arbitration. So English law of the seat, uh, sorry, the seat of the arbitration was London. Uh, so English law applies to the arbitration uh, agreement on the facts of this case, right? So the minor, so I was saying at the, at the outset, this was a three, two decision. So we have a minority uh, court decision here. So the minority decision was that um, the law of the arbitration agreement was Russian law and not English law, right? So the minority actually generally followed the same rules as, as the uh, majority decision, but on the facts, they came to a different conclusion because the minority felt that looking at the terms, other, all the terms of the contract and the wider circumstances, uh, for instance, that, that this was really in relation to the project in Russia, uh, the, the minority view was that parties had chosen impliedly uh, Russian law to, to apply to the contract and therefore Russian law should apply to the arbitration agreement as well. Okay, so yeah, this, this is uh, basically uh, uh, about this decision. I think um, the decision really uh, illustrates how clear drafting of uh, governing law and dispute clauses are important. Uh, you can see that in this case, it was, uh, there, there was so much litigation. There was litigation in, in Russia, and then you had uh, litigation in, 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 in England and, and through all, these all, all the stages of, of, of proceedings. 
And all of that was just because there wasn't a, a clear drafting in the present case. So it was a case where there was no choice of law chosen in the contract at all. Okay, so in, in those circumstances, you can see how all sorts of litigation uh, emerged uh, because there was no clear um, contract clauses. <clears throat> so although the uh, Supreme Court arrived at the same result as the Court of Appeal, which was the lower court, in that they held that you know uh, English law is the um, choice of law of the arbitration agreement, the Supreme Court uh, rejected the Court of Appeal's view that there should be a general rule that the arbitration law of the arbitration agreement should just follow the seat, law of the seat. Okay. Um, and then I think the last comment I make is that you know um, the decision does bring some clarity, right? But uh, because there have been conflicting views on whether uh, the law of the arbitration agreement should follow the law of the seat or the law of uh, the contract. However, I think that there's still room for disputes because, uh, you know, basically you're, you will always be faced in a situation where the courts have to decide, is there an implied choice of law, right, that, that parties have made, or should I move on to the next stage and, and just determine which uh, system of law has the closest connection to the, uh, to the arbitration agreement. And I think I'll just close off with this question, which is, uh, should we start making express choice of laws uh, for the arbitration agreement? Should we start uh, in incorporating such clauses in arbitration agreements? Um, I, think, I think it's something for discussion perhaps even later, but the main point is I think if you are clear and you know how all the laws operate and you are sure that this all works together, like you know your choices of law are all uh, effective and the arbitration clause agreement is effective, then you should make a clear choice. But if you are not clear on how it all works out together, um, then, then it can uh, create uh, some problems. Yeah. So with that, I think I'll just uh, hand, 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 hand back to uh, Punit. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karnan. So thank you for summarizing this decision. And uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, people who are on the commercial side are thinking, so how does this kind of impact me? What will that happen? And what do I do tomorrow morning in my, in my day job um, and, and figure out the way to do it? So let me try and bring this uh, a little bit on the commercial focus. And then Captain Dutt will also be able to join in and, and uh, help us with his uh, perspective as well. Uh, the first thing I wanted to just make sure that each of these legal and commercial perspectives that we are presenting are unique to each case. Um, so every case has its own applicable facts and legal issues. So we are not trying to make it a generalized uh, discussion about all cases, but specifically about this particular case and what can we draw from it. Uh, coming to the Enka and Chup, I think the key aspect that's covered in this particular uh, case is the governing law of arbitration agreement, something that a lot of people do not really pay attention to. It's a very usual thing, and I've been in commercial shipping companies. People normally end up agreeing English law to apply, Singapore arbitration, SCMA rules. That's it. They don't really go deeper into it and try to imagine that English law to apply is only a substantive law, which is contract uh, for the governing law of the contract. And there needs to be an understanding about what the arbitration agreement will actually have the applicable law. And that's not something that people think about at all. So these two aspects, I think I want to highlight. Um, these are quotations from the judgment itself. Um, so wherever the parties have not specified the law applicable on the commercial agreement, uh, on the arbitration agreement, obviously I can tell you a lot of companies and a lot of employees do not even know that there is a specific law applicable to arbitration agreement. They only think about the governing law of the contract. As I said, they say English law to apply and that's according to them enough. That is the chosen law to govern the contract. So in general cases, the court believes that they actually will apply to the arbitration agreement as well. And the second thing they made, like uh, Karnan, you explained that there's no choice of law made, that wording English law to apply doesn't appear in your recap, doesn't appear in your charter party. Then of course, they need to look at this closest connection. Um, so what does that actually mean in real terms on the commercial side? So I'll just run you through these three options that you already mentioned the three-stage process. The first stage is there is an express choice 
So the first clause in the charter party is arbitration in Singapore as per SCMA rules. The second clause is this charter party shall be governed by English law. In this case, English law becomes the governing law, which is the substantive law of the contract. Uh, and that's what the first law that you mentioned, the substantive law. In case that second clause, the clause two is absent, then there is no express choice of governing law of contract, no substantive law. And that's when the courts will start looking at the contract terms and then see if a choice can be implied through one of these terms. And in the discussion, Karnan, you can kind of give us some examples, what kind of an employed choice can actually be uh, made by the courts in this, uh, in this instance, when there is no uh, mess, there's no clear governing law uh, of contract chosen by the parties. If the implication is also not possible, that you can't expressly choose the governing law of contract, there's no implication possible, then comes the closest connection discussion. And then obviously, in general, the chosen seat of arbitration may be the closest connection to the arbitration agreement. So as long as the first clause is present, it may well be that Singapore law will apply to a contract. But again, we must emphasize that the closest connection is very, very important. Uh, and it may be different as, as uh, Karnan explained. But this is the usual scenario in a contract. You have these two clauses which are there in all the main terms, all the charter parties, arbitration in a particular place with a certain forum, sometimes not even the forum, just the arbitration in Singapore, for example, and the governing law of the charter party. So in this case, the key lessons learned, obviously, in this scenario is like in case of a subrogation, the parties kind of inherit the rights. So this is very difficult for parties to do much because the contract already has a clause or may not have a clause. It's difficult for parties to do anything in that cases. However, the key clarifications is that the principle of closest connection will apply in case there is no express and no implied uh, governing law chosen for the contract. So that's a very good lesson learned that you need to make sure that your contract needs to have some clarity. Otherwise, the closest connection will be uh, put into place. And in case the parties have control, they have control over the situation, they have charter party clauses, they have bill of lading ability to put clauses, they must use a model clause uh, like the standard law and arbitration clause. For example, the BIMCO has one with SCMA and other bodies. Um, and of course, in the ENCA and CHUB, the customized clause of arbitration was too complicated and did not have the right kind of understanding. And that created the biggest challenge. So this is where we have to really realize the value of using the arbitration clause clearly and understanding the difference between law of contract and law of the arbitration agreement. There are two different set of laws that are actually applicable here. And finally, the last slide uh, is the essential element of uh, arbitration clause. So as I mentioned, this is something that we in SCMA are really keen and ICS Singapore is also keen to bring up more knowledge sharing, bring up awareness and skills. So the three things which really matter is that you need to choose the seat of arbitration in any arbitration clause. You need to choose the forum within the seat. Could be SCMA, it could be other forums in Singapore. And then you need to choose the governing law, not just of the contract, but of the agreement itself to arbitrate. Um, so we have the SCMA model arbitration clause, which is available on our website. And you can, as you can see very clearly that it talks about all disputes shall be resolved by arbitration in Singapore. That's the seat of arbitration. Arbitration rule of SCMA, the forum. And this contract shall be governed by Singapore or English law. Obviously, you are able to clarify that this is the arbitration agreement that is being governed by Singapore or English law. So once you get these three elements in place, you should be able to get a clause which should resolve all the doubts in the mind of the court and hopefully get you a very, very clear agreement between the parties as to where they are arbitrat arbitrating, what law will apply, and what will be the forum. So this is the kind of commercial aspect which I think is quite relevant. Uh, Captain Dutt, would you like to add something to this from an operational perspective? Thank you, Puneet. I, I think you, you have really uh, put uh, everything into a nutshell. Um, so uh, you, you already highlighted that not many people spend too much of time on this clause. You know, let's, let's look at the practical side of chartering. Um, it is something which is there and, and just filed and forgotten until you have a problem you know so so that's the 
uh, mindset towards the arbitration clause itself. But having said that, you have rightly pointed out that BIMCO has some very well tailored, very um, accurately worded clauses in place, and we we just need to use them. Um, and and uh, as you say, just just strike out um, the the law which. Uh, you don't need to apply, and there you are. You you have it done in a couple of minutes. You know, I, I think as we as we get more uh, uh, using uh, digitalized forms or BIMCO's Charter Party Editor, it would be even simpler. Where you just uh, click on uh, the, the the seat that you need and the law that you need, and you are uh, pretty much done with it. Um, practically, I think that would appeal to uh, most organizations where probably mid-level uh, seniority chartering people are then going through these, preparing these clauses. Another thing you should keep in mind is within our area, you know, where um, companies at in the Southeast Asia region, ASEAN, or even China, you must keep in mind that English may not be their mother tongue, their first language. So anything which comes in with too much of legal jargon is, is probably difficult to digest. So as I said, these ready-made clauses are the perfect solution and, and are complete in nature when, when applied. You know, one shouldn't get creative to delete these clauses and then try and rewrite them in the rider clauses. You know, you are stepping into the fire that way. So that's all, uh, Puneet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I fully agree with you, not just the BIMCO, but also other, most of the other charter party forms do have the, um, do have the uh, specific arbitration clauses which are customized or tailor-made to certain trades. So we should just try and stick to them. Um, creating your own clause, I think you should take legal opinion for sure. Uh, but this is the key aspect of the case, which I think I want to highlight. The idea that there's a two different laws applying, one to the contract itself and one to arbitration agreement is not something which is very commonly understood in the commercial uh, world as such. And that was something which was quite interesting for me to, uh, to discuss. One thing I would like to ask you, Karnan, is about this implication. Express choice of law agreed, uh, substantive law. If not there, there's an implied choice of law, of governing law of contract. How can this implication or implied uh, law be inferred by the courts? What could be some examples of what contract terms will the courts look at? Okay, so you've got, um, I think looking at the, uh, at the Anchor and Chubb decision itself, right? So express choice of law would be really the clear, clearest example is, you know, where, like you said, you know, you've got a clause that says English law is the governing law of this contract or English law to apply. Uh, implied, uh, um, implied choice of law would be discerned from all the terms of the agreement and the circumstances. So like in the minority court decision, they said, you know, one of the features was, you know, this was really a, a contract for the construction of a project in Russia, right? So everything was supposed to be there, insured, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the other bit is there were references to Russian law in the contract, right? Sure. So they said, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, there were terms like applicable law is Russian law, but it didn't say it was governing law, the contract. So there were other clauses that gave the indication that maybe you know, parties had, in, in, had, had intended to, uh, to, to apply Russian law to, this, to, this, to, the, to, this, uh, to, to the contract. Um, I think just to contrast that with the majority decision, the reason why the majority court said that there was no implied choice of law, right? Uh, was because they said they came to the view that parties left the choice of law out, right? Because they couldn't agree on what it was, right? So if both parties couldn't agree and that's why it's it's out, then um, then there's no implied choice of law. But if you look at the other clauses and, you know, the, the circumstances, putting it all together, can you imply that parties um, actually had, had this choice in mind? Yeah. Sure. 